Hello everyone. I'll start out by apologizing in advance. There's some kind of construction work going on and I can't really pick the times that I film so I just went ahead anyway but you might hear a bunch of diesel engines and clanging sounds in the background. But I think I have a very interesting video. You know I was digging around in the vault and uh, I came, came across this rifle which is a Remington SPS. I think it might even be the youth model. Um, so what happened was really simple. I was reading about all these Barrett um, rifles and so forth and the 50 BMG and just reflecting on ballistics in general and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have as well. And I was looking at the energy and trajectory figures for the 50 BMG and it's, it's a, a 750 grain bullet at about 2,800 some feet per second. I actually looked it up just before filming so I can sound half intelligent. And um, the energy is over 13,000 foot-pounds of energy. So, you know, there's a lot of sauce in that cartridge for sure. Uh, and then I was thinking about the ballistics and trajectory and recoil and I was, I, ha I have some 50 BMG on the workbench. <clears throat> and I thought maybe I should look at doing things another way. So I went online and I looked up uh, on a site that calculates ballistics and I, I punched in a 200 grain bullet at 5,500 feet per second. And um, other than having a laser flat trajectory because of the velocity, the energy works out to just slightly more than the 50 BMG and I invite you to check on that. A 200 grain bullet at 5,500 feet per second because of um, the, the rules that Einstein spelled out has incredible energy. <clears throat> so how to accomplish that? Well, I actually set out to just investigate the whole concept of extremely high velocity. And naturally, as always, there were lots of people before me. And uh, in fact, I found, I found out that a lot of tanks and artillery uh, fire cartridges uh, depending on the source and it's hard to know what's reliable on the web but apparently some rounds are going 7,000 feet per second I'm not sure after my primitive investigations whether I believe 7,000 but it's possible in any event this Remington SPS is not what it seems and I, I also have to apologize for my poor cameras and so on but if I showed you the bore of this rifle, you would see no rifling. I ordered the, the rifle with, with no rifling. So why no rifling? Well, in case there are some of you that aren't aware of it, a shotgun has no rifling and therefore it's called a shotgun and a rifle has rifling, which is the spiral in the bore, um, which is inscribed on the bullet. <clears throat> and that's why police can match um, rifles and pistols to cartridges, they match the rifling, that, that scribing that takes place. So when you fire a cartridge, this is a 308, um, it, it's a kind of a push-pull situation. The powder is progressive burning. And by now, you, I'm sure all are aware that Hollywood gets it wrong when they show a cartridge exploding when you throw it in the fire. Um, I've done that lots of times to, for, for uh, audiences and actually nothing happens. The, the powder ignites, the brass case splits, and mostly there's, it's very uneventful. But if you contain smokeless powder in a, in a confined and strong uh, cartridge, then the pressures rise dramatically and they drive, they increase incrementally. Um, so when you fire a 308, and here's this typical 308 round, when this is confined, you end up getting full velocity. And part of the magic of centerfire cartridges is that as the powder burns and the pressure increases, um, the, the pressure increases yet again. So you have a sequential, extremely rapid increase in pressure, microseconds, as we all know. When you pull the trigger and that primer ignites, you're starting a sequence that's essentially irreversible if the powder is dry. <clears throat> so, I have some training, it's true, but I began this investigation in a primitive way. 
the bore is smooth, I thought I'll just fire a factory round like a box and see what happens. Um, I had a chronograph, actually I had two, uh, partially because I wasn't sure what would happen with velocities. Anyhow, you fire a factory cartridge in a smooth bore and the velocity is quite low. So why? Well, one logic is that the bore is smooth, the bullet now has nothing to resist its movement down the barrel, so it should travel faster. But that's not what happens because the bore is not sealed. The bullet actually is deformed in a way swaged down to the bore size and the rifling inscribed on the bullet and it's that back pressure that creates the gas seal that increases the pressure from the progressive burning powder and I may be simplifying things a little bit but essentially I think even you experts out there will agree that's how you end up with 2,000 or 3,000 feet per second but you are always in a way defeating your own purpose because the rifling is causing tremendous friction which is why your barrel heats up that along with the amount of powder you're burning so all the efforts to increase velocity typically have involved like Weatherby cartridges more powder the bullets are essentially the same they may strengthen them when they expect increased velocity like in the Weatherby's and others like 338 Lapua and BMG so the jacket thickness will be different but essentially it's the same principle increase the volume of powder you increase the volume of gas and pressure but it's it's not a hundred thousand pounds per square inch we're talking I think like 60 70 80 thousand pounds per square inch anyway my hypothesis I felt was sound we get rid of the rifling and um, so I fired the factory cartridges no increase in velocity um, also the bullets tumbled which you would expect even arrows have fletching that stabilizes them so without that gyroscopic action of the spinning bullet, it tumbles. Uh, but I had to overcome the problem of the gas seal. So I thought, well, I'll deal with that later. First of all, I'm going to try to get the projectile stable. But this is investigative thinking, and I probably you know, should have thought about it more. So anyway, here's, I, and I tried many different case materials. I tried brass, I tried steel. Steel cases are deceiving. I learned a few things about steel cases. For example, although this is a 308, I first tested a 7.62 by 39. And it's not that complicated to figure out what, what's happening when you fire a steel case in a chamber. The, part, the powder is confined, it's true, in the chamber by means of the steel case, but the steel case actually does not deform as many as, uh, as, as, uh, as many of you might think. The steel case actually doesn't quite take the shape of the chamber. The chamber is there to support it if, if it needs to be supported, but the steel case actually becomes the chamber in a way. So I just mentioned that as a footnote because it was kind of interesting and I determined that in several different um, empirical ways. Um, anyway, on the table here is an aluminum case, and I, I'm, I'm trying to get in, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but um, I wanted to try different cases, aluminum, steel, brass. Then I wanted to accomplish what a shotgun accomplishes. So when you fire a shotgun slug in a smooth bore, the slug is fired actually in a weight forward way, and that's why shotgun slugs stay on a relatively straight path the weight is forward so I, I got some bullets and a lot of people have done this and I loaded them backwards now I knew I would not accomplish a gas seal with the with the reverse cartridge but I wanted to see whether there was any stability in in the uh, in the projectile itself and uh, of course it was slightly more stable but the there was um, there was still yaw happening and I, I set up pieces of paper at different distances so I could see when the projectile started tipping to try to figure out whether there's a pattern to when the, car, the bullet becomes unstable. And uh, since there was no gyroscopic action, the bullet wasn't spinning at all, the bore is smooth, I did expect yaw to occur and the bullet would tumble and keyhole in the end. But I learned a few things from that. 
And then one day, I mean, this whole process took maybe a year. Um, but again, it's not my livelihood. It was just something I was interested in. And then one day I realized that when there's rifling, you have to think, think about things like rate of twist, pressure, the amount of powder, how the powder burns, the rate of the burn. And I had no scientific instrumentation to determine chamber pressures. I could only observe the primer pocket and deformation of the cases and things like that, routine things that, that reloaders do. Um, in any event, I finally realized that I have to disassociate the projectile from the cartridge. A smooth bore rifle um, is indifferent to the weight of, of the projectile in a sense. In other words, the, the bullet could be an inch long, it could be two inches long. The point was, how do I accomplish bore sealing, stability, and enough strength in, in, the, in, the, in the bullet, which now is traveling at hyper velocity um, when it reaches the target. And uh, in case people are saying you don't need this for hunting, well, you, you do and you don't. The trajectory is great. At 5,500 feet per second, you don't need to aim higher or lower. Um, you probably don't need any kind of range finder. It's, it's point blank range. I didn't calculate, but you can figure out what I'm getting at. The energy figures are dramatic, but it is not true that you vaporize targets. Actually, when projectiles are traveling at hypervelocity, they tend to just punch a hole. And actually, this experiment, which went on, like I said, for a while, ended when I was no longer comfortable with what I was doing because I felt the velocities were too high, my methods and my equipment were too primitive. So I set the project aside actually until this video when I, when I pulled this out. Um, so what happened next? I tried, once I realized it didn't matter what projectile, it didn't have to have a certain weight restriction um, because there's no, there's no stability in the rifling because there is no rifling. So then I realized, okay, well, why, are, why am I using like 3031 and things like that for the cartridge? That was, that related to the old style of thinking. And then kind of in a moment, I realized the trick is to get the pressure in the cartridge. I don't want any powder burning down the barrel because there's no back pressure. I hadn't accomplished a seal yet. So then I thought, well, that opens up a whole bunch of possibilities. So I need the fastest possible burning powder, but that could cause a problem with the strength of the action. And at this point in this video, I'm gonna become vague for a variety of reasons which you can figure out. But what I can tell you is I found a combination of very fast burning powders, which are not designed really for rifles because typically in a rifle, you have the back pressure of the bullet, which increases, like I said earlier, the pressure curve is predictable. I was in unexplored territory, at least for me. And I, I know that NASA works on rail guns and there are electric guns and all that stuff, but that, this is actually in between those types of technologies and more conventional powder and cartridge and bullet um, guns as we think of them. Anyhow, when I realized I can increase pressures in the chamber, now I took some measures, safety measures, to make sure the primer didn't leave the primer pocket. I was worried about gas leakage around the primer pocket, uh, which had happened to me before uh, in just conventional reloading. You've all seen that. And um, then my focus went from, okay, I can accomplish extremely high pressure in the chamber the Remington 700 action didn't seem to, it was, it was indifferent to pressure. And the projectile became lighter than I expected. And again, I'm going to be deliberately vague because this is more of a, a, I would say a scientific presentation than like a sporting gun presentation. But it's something that is quite interesting. And some of you with a lot greater brains and know-how can think about this. And, um, so anyway, I did accomplish a projectile that sealed the bore and traveled at velocity that was extremely high. But as I told you a moment ago, it was at that juncture that
that I became uncomfortable, partly because the projectile can't be a typical jacketed bullet. There's too much pressure, but it's a different kind of pressure, and if my terminology becomes weak, it's because I don't know exactly how to express what was happening. But when I examined the targets, the, the backstops, I could see that the strength of the projectile required different backstops. These projectiles were simply not being predictably stopped. They weren't behaving um, as I would expect projectiles to, to behave. Now I'm talking about velocities about 2,000 feet per second faster than what I was um, accustomed to seeing in a 308. And most chronographs uh, seem to go up to about 7,000 feet per second and I was nowhere near that. Uh, but you would be surprised what happens if you get the right mix of powders, enough pressure so that you launch your projectile at hyper velocity, but not enough pr pressure to destroy your action. And of course there was remote firing going on in some of these sequences and strings of shots um, for safety reasons. So net result is that you, um, you, you, you can accomplish hypervelocity and a virtually laser-like trajectory, you will notice that your bore is cooler because there isn't that bore friction from the rifling. The bullet is not being swaged down and in a sense deformed. Uh, the flight time is shockingly minimal to 200 yards and this all should be explored properly and scientifically and maybe it has been and I looked on the web and there's a lot of talk about a lot of stuff but I thought I would share with you that even in my primitive kind of rudimentary ways um, some remarkable things were accomplished and uh, with no apparent danger and no um, bad consequence but this would all have to be like I said explored better and the last thing I'll mention to you is that so put yourself in my position you're thinking your bullets are tumbling or you've created a projectile and I had some projectiles turned on a on a lathe um, with different shapes and so forth but, but you you realize okay the problem is the bullets aren't spinning so then I decided well I can't wire guide these projectiles because they're too small and you can read about that on the web so I came up with the concept of an internally stabilized projectile. In other words, if we can't make the bullet a gyroscope and they're only stable like a spinning top, the minute they stop spinning, they stop being stable. And with the velocities I was getting out of this rifle, we were I was on the ragged edge of, of predictability. So I thought, get an internally stabilized projectile, put the gyroscope inside the bullet. But again, there's not much room to work with. It's very small. Also, what happens after impact? But again, the materials I was using for the projectiles were extremely strong. And at the velocities I was achieving, I noticed that they weren't really deforming much, not, not the way I would expect them to. They were also going through things that should have typically stopped bullets, but partly because of the bullet material, and partly because of the velocity. Like I said, I felt there must be some barrier that I'm going past with with these velocities so I uh, I left it at that and and I've left it for years but um, I never succeeded with an internally stabilized projectile um, like I said there isn't much room there are ways there are, it can be done but not by me and so or not with what I have to work with but I thought I'd mention this to you and aside from everything else <laughs> A smoothbore 308 sounds ridiculous, uh, but once you figure out the powder and the projectiles, uh, it's surprisingly accurate, much like a smoothbore shotgun can shoot slugs a lot more accurately than we think. Anyhow, that's an awful lot of talking, and you probably don't tune into my channel for this kind of thing, but I thought this is maybe something because of my interest and training and whatever that I would share with you and maybe greater minds out there can do something with this. I probably will run out of time or I've already run out of time. So I put it out there for you and uh, the barrel's easy to order. Just tell them don't rifle it. 
and you have um, an unrifled 308 or whatever caliber you want. Maybe you want more powder. I chose the 308 just because ammunition is so cheap. And I could spin this off and put something else on, but I think I'm going to keep it smooth bore. It's just so interesting. And you're not restricted in projectile length or, or sectional density. That all goes out the window because there's no rifling. There's not, the bullet is not pushing back. It's just going forward. So that's how you get those velocities. Anyhow, um, yeah, please send me your comments. It was a lot of fun. And on the table, I just put some 308 Winchester ammunition. I think that's what I started my testing with. And then, of course, these are Hornady bullets. And I, I, um, I've got this one in backward. And I, I tried many different, I, you know, putting a bullet in backwards looks ridiculous. It's not that ridiculous. It's actually quite interesting if, if, if expansion is not an issue, which it was not. So that is, um, I think, quite a different video from my others, and uh, I, I hope you can keep up with my talking and, and the ideas that I'm trying to convey. Um, and maybe it's something that, that people should look into, uh, if, if for no other reason than a scientific um, exploration of hypervelocity, uh, which is an entirely uh, unique field, at least to me. Anyhow, that's it, and thanks for watching.